see if Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Just uh, if you can verify that you can hear me okay, uh, that'd be great before we start. But just let me know in the chat if you can hear me. I'm just going to admit a few people who are waiting in the waiting room. And I'll just type it in the chat. Can you hear me? Awesome. Okay, thanks for letting me know. Great. Okay, so we'll get started in three minutes. So I'll be back at 11.05. Awesome. Thanks, guys. All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. We are going to be talking about leases. So for those of you who haven't joined me on this webinar before, my name is Jane Stevens. I'm the training manager here at Zolo. I do the new, or, the new agent orientations on Mondays and Wednesdays. So if you ever need a refresher on the CRM, feel free to join on Monday and Wednesday. Those ones start at 10 as opposed to 11. Uh, but we do have a special webinar coming up um, on Thursday. So we're going to have a few of the GMs join me and we're going to answer all of your CRM related questions uh, and more. So definitely tune into that one on Thursday. Um, but today, like I said, we are talking about leases. So I have somebody commenting that you have to, you have to write an offer to lease today. That's awesome. So hopefully you feel really confident in doing that. So as you guys know, here at Zolo, we do require that you do five leases. If you're brand new to real estate, um, it's, you know, doing five leases really gets you familiar with the paperwork and, uh, you know, really gets you ready, really prepared when, um, when it comes time to prepare those buyer offers. So uh, lots of practice here. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I love when you guys talk to me. So let's talk about leases. Let me know if you guys have questions as we go along. Uh, but really, there's lots of reasons to do leases. I already mentioned that if you're new to Zolo, then we do require that you do those five leases before we turn, off, turn on your buyer lead. 
but really even agents who have been with us for a really long time continue to do leases. Again, lots of reasons for that. Definitely cash flow is one of the reasons. I know some agents will do three, five, eight plus leases a month. So definitely that adds up. So if you have buyers who are sitting on the fence, they're not sure what they're going to do, um, do some leases in the meantime. That definitely creates some cash flow. It also uh, increases your CRM activity. So if you have leases coming in and you're engaging with them, you're taking them out on showings, you're writing deals, all of that activity you know, shows the Zolobot that you are an active full-time agent. And the Zolobot really does reward active agents with leads. So definitely you know, keeping your CRM activity up is a good thing. And of course, it does grow your network of potential buyers. So if you put in, you know, if you have a, a lease lead that you've worked with, you've done a great job for them, you put them into their rental, and a year goes by, hopefully at that point they're ready to buy. And again, if you've done a good job and you've kept in touch with them, that's the other uh, piece to it, then hopefully they think of you when the time comes to buy. So it definitely grows your network of potential buyers. And as I said at the very beginning, it familiarizes yourself with the paperwork. So once you do a bunch of leases, uh, working with buyers will feel like a walk in the park. Because really with leases, you're wearing all of the different hats, right? You're sort of the mortgage broker qualifying them. You're the realtor, of course, showing them properties and writing the offer. But then at the end of the day, you're also the lawyer, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, the keys are, um, you know, given to the tenant and the posted to checks are exchanged. You're kind of doing that closing paperwork as well. So let's jump into it. Let's talk about it. I see that some people have leases that they are ready to, to prepare. So let's talk about, <laughs> first of all, how to qualify the lead. So before you get to that stage, but we will be talking about how to prepare an offer to lease. Oh. Sorry, I'm just going to take a sip of my water. Uh, so let's talk about pre-qualifying because really this is going to be the most important thing. You don't want to be running around with people who aren't qualified. Of course, we would love to help everybody, but it's just not possible. If you come across somebody who has a really low credit score or somebody who you know, has had their income interrupted due to COVID and they've been on CERB for the last several months, then really it's going to be better for them if you just put them in touch directly with the listing agent. Maybe the listing agent is motivated to double end the deal, but really even better than that is to put them in touch with listings that are available on Kijiji and Facebook Marketplace because those are generally going to be posted directly by the landlord and they may have less criteria than they would if they're using a realtor. So explaining that to the client, you know, giving them good customer service, even if you're not able to help them directly, at least point them in the right direction. But let's talk about how you can pre-qualify them so that you can determine whether or not you're able to help them. So this is a short and simple script that I bring up in the CRM training. So you want to be receiving phone calls. You want to be making phone calls to anybody that you may have missed in your CRM. And really, you want to start that conversation with how can I help? It's such a great way to start the conversation because generally speaking, they will tell you their whole life story, what their situation is, why they're looking, what they're looking for. So you can really start a good conversation with just simply how can I help? If you ask close-ended questions like how many bedrooms are you looking for, you know, what's your price point, it just becomes more work for you <laughs> to ask all those questions. Just start off, how can I help you, and get the information from them. Have a conversation, and then at some point during the conversation, you want to turn the table so that you can now explain the process to them. So a really good way to shift the conversation from them to you is simply to ask them if they're familiar with the process. And it doesn't matter if they say yes or no, this is your opportunity to take over and explain what the process is. So even if they say, yes, I'm familiar with the process, you know, I rented two years ago, I've been in the, you know, same rental property for a while, then you can say, great, so then you know that the lease market is really competitive right now. So if your budget is $2,500, i am going to show you properties that are listed for $2,500 and less. If I show you properties that are $2,600, $2,700, they're not likely to go for less than asking. So in other words, you're, regardless of what they say about how familiar they are with the process, you're going to say, great, and carry on with explaining the process in that you know, they need to know that the lease market is competitive because you don't want to be showing things that, things that are out of their budget. And then you definitely want to be asking them questions about two things their credit score, and their income. And make it about the landlord. The landlord is going to want to see a credit score of at least 650. The landlord is going to want to see that you can afford the rent. And so the landlords typically want to see that the rent isn't more than 30% of your income. So talking to them about that, asking them what their income is, asking them what their credit score is, if they get defensive, chances are they're not qualified. Um, if they do disclose the information, then great. That's how you can make a decision whether or not you're going to run around with them, show them properties, or whether you're going to have to pass them off to the listing agent um, or point them in the direction of Kijiji or Facebook Marketplace. 
So assuming that all goes well, your conversation goes really well, they're super qualified, perfect. When would you like to see some properties, right? And then you can schedule properties to view on Saturday at one, whatever the situation is, right? And then hopefully you're showing them more than just the one property that they inquired about. Hopefully you can show them three to four properties. Um, definitely so that obviously the chances of them liking something are higher than if you just show them one property. All right, so similar to inbound calls, there are going to be times when you are calling somebody back if you've missed their call for whatever reason. Just make sure you're speaking to the lead who inquired. Introduce yourself as calling from Zolo.ca. I find that if you say Zolo Realty, people aren't as familiar with that, so they know us as a website, not so much as a brokerage. And then just remind them, I see that you inquired about 123 Main Street. How can I help you? And when would you like to see the property? In between those questions, really explaining the process and asking those pre-qualifying questions. So let's talk about what those pre-qualifying questions are. Um, this is actually kind of an overview of the whole system that you should have in place. If you really want to be successful with leases, you want to have a system in place. You don't want to be receiving phone calls from people who want to see properties right now and you drop everything and you run out the door and you're an agent on demand uh, because you don't know if they're qualified or not, right? And you're going to be disrupting your day. Um, it, it's just not going to be a very good sustainable system to have in place. So you really want to make sure that when you are receiving these calls, you are pre-qualifying them over the phone. Now, um, you'll want to also follow up with an email after that conversation because you're going to want to reiterate what you already told them, right? So what documents they need. You're going to want to send them a rental application. In addition to that email follow-up, you're also going to want to set them up on a TREB search, right? So that they're getting um, emails directly from you with properties that actually uh, fit their search criteria. So a couple of things that you want to do there. Uh, before taking them out on showings, and then of course asking for the business after you've taken them out on showings. So this is really an overview of the system that you want to have. You want to have that initial conversation with those leads that come in. How can you help? When would you like? When would they like to see the property? Explaining the process, pre-qualifying them on the phone, and the next screen I'll show you even some more questions about how to pre-qualify them, and then following up with that email, sending them the rental application with the list of required documents. I'll share with you a template as well that you can use. And then following up as well with a TREB prospect search so that, yes, of course, they're going to continue to browse on Zolo, but hopefully this way they are receiving listings as soon as they hit the market and they can reply to you right away if they see something that they want, um, that they're really interested in, right? They want to go take a look at it. Uh, they can let you know right away. Scheduling showings, again, making sure that you're showing them at least three properties. Now, sometimes people will, you know, reply to your TREB email and say, oh my goodness, all of these look great, can I see all 10 properties? Really ask them to narrow it down to three to four and just let them know any more than that and they all start to look the same. It's a really easy way to say, <laughs> you know, pick three or four. So um, going off to that, showing them, showing them three, or more, three, or more, three or four properties, not three or more, um, that hopefully will, um, you, you'll find something on that, you know, first showing. Maybe you take them out on two showings, but hopefully they find something quite quickly and that uh, you're able to write the offer and get it done. You don't want to be spending every single weekend with the same lease leads. These are meant to be quick, short transactions. So really making sure, in addition to your pre-qualifying questions, what their timeline is. Because if their timeline isn't for, you know, two months, three months, the properties that we're looking at right now or you would look at, are available at the beginning of the following month, typically, right? So you want to make sure that these people are ready to go, whoever it is that you're working with. And then, of course, asking for the business, um, you know, asking them as you're showing them properties, what they like about property number one versus number two versus number three. So you can really narrow down what it is that they're looking for. And then you can help them even further, right? By the end of showing them three to four properties, you should know which one their favorite is. And then ask them at the end of all of the showings, which one they'd like to put an offer in on. So at that point, you want to be receiving the paperwork and preparing the offers. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I've got some people saying hello. Feel free to ask me questions if you have any questions or even input as to something that you've incorporated into having a system that works well for you. Because really, as I said, it's all about having a system in place with lease leads that you can get these done really quickly. As I said, there are agents here at Zolo that do, you know, five plus leases a month, and it's because they have a system. They're pre-qualifying people on the phone, um, and they're also making maybe taking that extra step of calling the listing agent. So we don't always have, you know, situations that are super easy and straightforward, you know, like the young professional couple or the, you know, small family. Sometimes we have unique situations. Maybe it's a single parent. Maybe they're brand new to Canada. Uh, you know, whatever the situation is, maybe they're roommates, 
call the listing agent, find out if the landlord is going to consider that situation. And um, if not, then you don't show that property. It's all about saving as much time as possible. The rental application, where do you find it? So that is in web form. You can find the rental application. I like to have a downloaded copy. So go to web forms. Um, really, you can Google uh, the rental application. You can find it on the Ontario Landlord Tenant Board as well. Um, and just download a blank copy. Save it somewhere on your computer so that you can easily email that to lease leads when they inquire about a property. Um, do we have to complete the Ontario lease agreement as well? Yes, we do. Um, really, if if we're if we're saying this properly, it's the listing agent. It's really the landlord and tenant. It's between them to complete the Ontario lease agreement, so the residential tenancy agreement. Um, so really, it should be the responsibility of the listing agent. But in my experience and speaking with other agents here at Zolo, um, that often doesn't happen in a timely manner, and it does need to be completed after your offer has been accepted and before they move into the property. So you could even have it um, you know, completed at the time of the landlord and tenant exchanging keys and post-dated checks. If you're there, you can have that residential tenancy agreement signed at the same time. Because really that is them exchanging information. So now the landlord should have the tenant's contact information and the tenant should have the landlord's. So it's actually something that I put in um, my offer email. So when I'm sending an offer to lease to a listing agent, I'll volunteer to prepare the residential tenancy agreement just because it's going to show that I'm easy to work with. I'm going to take some work off of the listing agent's plate. Um, this way, I, I also know it'll get done. Um, so yeah, it's something that you might want to offer. Um, let me see. This is done in the end. Yes, the residential tenancy agreement is done after, uh, and, and everybody has a different practice about this, but it should be done once the offer is accepted. It, it is reiterating all of the accepted terms. So if you do it before then, then again, you're just making more work for yourself. So um, really here, I'm trying to encourage you guys to like have a system in place that, you know, makes you work less, <laughs> not harder. So let's, uh, let's jump into some more pre-qualifying questions and we'll get to that residential tenancy agreement as well. So love the questions, keep them coming. Thanks guys. All right, so have you recently rented a property? It's really the same thing as um, asking them if they're familiar with the process, right? So again, regardless of what they say, yes, I'm familiar, no, I'm not. Regardless, go ahead and explain it to them. Um, you know, let them know that the lease market is really competitive. You don't wanna be showing them properties that are way out of their budget. People seem to think that they can negotiate on leases and really for the most part, that's not the case. For the most part, you know, there is gonna be competition and there's gonna be multiple offers. And sometimes people do offer $50, $100 more on leases. So just let them know that. And then also let them know that landlords are gonna to wanna to see their credit score and employment letter. So credit score needs to be at least 650 and the employment letter actually doesn't need to be an employment letter if they don't have one. Sometimes that can take a few days to get. So pay stubs can also do the trick. Uh, regardless, you just need to be showing that they have an income uh, that affords the rent. So in other words, you don't want that rent to be more than 30% of their income. And get creative here. Don't be afraid to ask, you know, do you have any other sources of income? Because it may be that their employment doesn't show enough, but maybe they're receiving child support. Maybe they're, you know, they have an investment, you know, in a different province, an investment property that, you know, they're, they're getting some money from. So ask questions really so that you can, you know, represent them well on paper when you submit that offer to the listing agent. Make sure they have their credit report ready. So, you know, point them in the right direction. Equifax costs $20 to get their report, but there are some free versions that you can get. Credit Karma, Borrow Well, there's a whole bunch. You can just literally in your app store, uh, type in credit report, and there's some options there that you can recommend. So asking them if they know their credit score, again, you need to know what it is that the landlords are looking for. At least 650, at least 680, that's kind of, it used to be 650, but now I hear that landlords are wanting to see 680. So if you have a client who has a credit score in the, in the 700 range, great, work with them. <laughs> Do you have a letter of employment or employment contract or pay stubs? Really, either one of those things is gonna work. Um, and then is the rent less than 30% of your income? So that just goes back to, you know, making sure that they can afford it. And then asking them about their timeline. Where are you living? When is your lease up? Have you given notice? When are you looking to move in? And a really good question to also ask is who will be living with you? So this is about their timeline and about their situation. So if there's going to be, you know, five adults living together in a two bedroom condo and their budget is, you know, $2,300 a month, that's going to be really difficult for you to find. So again, that might be a situation where you point them in the direction of Kijiji or Facebook Marketplace so that, you know, they have 
better chances of finding something and you can go ahead and work with, you know, more qualified leads than that. So um, asking them if they've given their notice, that's uh, important in terms of timeline, because again, the properties that you'll see right now that are listed are probably available for, you know, November. We're, we're sitting at November 3rd today. So, you know, they're probably available immediately, maybe December 1st. Uh, there's not going to be a lot available for January 1st. So if they haven't even given their notice yet, they're not going to be ready until February. And those listings aren't even up yet. So uh, just, again, really know when it is that they're looking to move. Hopefully you have a conversation with them and they tell you, you know what, my landlord wants to list the place for sale that I'm currently renting. So I'm flexible. I can move anytime I find anything I like. Great. Definitely, you know, work with them. So <laughs> really understanding their situation. Um. Yeah, okay, so I'm getting a comment here. My landlords earn $12,000 a month. Already two landlords rejected our offer. Yes, I know. And that can be really frustrating sometimes. Um, so really make sure that it's the whole picture that you're looking at. Sometimes people have really great income, but not the best credit score, maybe. Um, so, you know, as you go along, you might figure out, you know, that you're not going to work with people who only have one of the two things. You really want to be working with people who have both. So great credit score, great income. But even having said that, I know I've been in that situation as well where, you know, I've even had clients offer a full year up front and um, they were rejected. And it, it really comes down in that situation. You know, I had to ask why, of course, because, you know, who rejects, you know, full year up front. They had good income. They had good credit. And really it came down to the size of the family. They had three kids and the other applicants only had, I think, one child. So it was less wear and tear. So you have to kind of think about, um, things from the landlord's perspective. You may have a really, you know, really qualified client, but when you're in competition, you never know what your competition is going to be, right? And maybe it does come down to number of people and that's the, the landlord sort of deciding factor. All you can do is do your best. So at least with that one, you know that you have qualified clients. It's just a matter of finding them now the right place. So sometimes, yes, you will get a rejection even though they're super qualified. Just move on to the next knowing that you have qualified clients, you will be able to find them something eventually. Um, yeah, so this webinar is recorded. We will definitely share it and post it on the YouTube channel. So I will link that as well. Um, yeah, so getting a question here about, or a situation, yeah, family of four with good and excellent credit score. I think landlords are picky. Yeah, absolutely. So, and again, if you are in a multiple offer situation with leases, you know, you may have somebody who's willing to take it immediately as opposed to, you know, the 1st of December, if it's available immediately, right? So um, maybe an increased deposit. So we're going to talk about all of that to really, you know, position your clients, even though they're already qualified, just increasing their chances of getting that, um, um, that place. Um, all right. So, credit report is showing the wrong date of birth. Will that be a problem? How to answer that? Um, yeah, so credit reports are usually pretty accurate. So just find out there, maybe get their um, driver's license and just cross references, see why there's a discrepancy there. Because yeah, they should be pretty accurate. All right, so let's just quickly talk about updating the CRM. That's really all I'm gonna say about this because you know this <laughs> from CRM training. Make sure that you're uh, updating all of your activities, definitely the call activity is super important to move them into the engage folder and then you know eventually we'll be taking them out on showing but um yeah connecting with that lead that comes in definitely having a conversation and not forgetting to update your crm all right i'm not going to get into all of this because that is uh, mostly crm training stuff um, and you guys know all that so follow-up email this is the template i wanted to share with you guys so once you've had that initial conversation with them You've asked them some pre-qualifying questions. You've decided that, yes, this is somebody you want to work with. Their credit score is good. Their income is good. Their situation, you know, isn't going to scare a landlord. <laughs> then this is an email that you might want to send immediately after that conversation. So thank you for your interest in rental properties. And then obviously you tweak this depending on your conversations. The properties you inquired about are available. I'd be happy to show them to you at your convenience. Or you say, I will schedule, you know, showings on Saturday at 1 p.m. I will send you a separate email with our itinerary, right? In the meantime, so carrying on here, I'm attaching a rental application for you to review and complete before viewing properties. Honestly, that's something that uh, is up to you. I take it out. The rental application needs to be prepared before submitting an offer. So really make sure that they're ready to go. Um, again, I don't ask for it back because uh, before showing them properties, and that's, you know, a style thing. You can ask 
for them to complete the rental application before showing them properties, but really they haven't met you. Um, so yes, they've answered your pre-qualifying questions over the phone, but the rental application asks for information that they actually don't need to provide, like their social insurance number and their bank account information. They haven't met you yet. So I think it might be a lot to ask for some people to submit that to you before they've even met you and before they've even looked at properties and before they've even found one. So definitely attach the rental application and just say it's for them to review and complete before submitting an offer. And then you can carry on and say, if you find a property you like, I can assist you with preparing an offer to lease. At that time, landlords will typically request the following documents. So a couple of important things there. Um, you're letting them know that you will prepare the offer to lease on their behalf. You're not just there to open doors. So you're there to prepare an offer to lease and to win their business. So, you know, you also want to be making sure, of course, that they're not already working with another realtor um, and they just think that you're the listing agent. That's something else you might want to incorporate in that initial phone call. Uh, but definitely letting them know that you're there to prepare an offer to lease. And then at that time, landlord, so again, you're making it about the landlord, not about you, the landlord is gonna request the following document. So the credit report, and you might even wanna put in brackets 650 plus, letter of employment, I would put this on one line, letter of employment or pay stub, so in bracket proof of income. And again, you might wanna put further in brackets, you might wanna say, you know, rent shouldn't be more than one third of your income, just so that they know. And then photo ID, that's for your purposes so that you know, they are who they say they are, and you're, um, you know, obviously filling them in, uh, filling in the correct spelling of their names and that sort of thing once you get to the offer stage. So letting them know as well, a heads up, as soon as the offer is accepted, you'll also need your deposit ready, which is typically the first and last month's rent. So that's definitely something you want to give them a heads up about. You don't want to be running around with people and then, you know, they don't have $5,000 first and last month's rent. Uh, it's not available to them. They didn't know that. So just give them a heads up. And then let me know if you have any questions. I look forward to hearing from you and helping with your home search. However you'd like to say it, uh, this is short and sweet and definitely something that you can incorporate. Uh, definitely have something that you send to them after your initial phone call. And then also include, of course, your um, email signature so that you have your contact information there so they know how to reach out to you. They may not have saved your phone number into their phone right away, uh, but if they receive an email from you, they'll know how to, how to follow up with you. So in addition to this email, of course, you also want to be setting them up on TREB. You want to be sending them listings directly from MLS so that they are being notified every day of new listings that match their search criteria so that you can schedule all of those showings, uh, you know, for an hour or two, uh, hopefully one time, maybe twice. And that's going to be part of your system to get these deals done as quickly as possible. All right, so compiling, compiling the rental application. So again, not everybody's gonna give you the rental application right away. It usually happens once you've found the property, but I'm just gonna quickly talk about what I mentioned before. It goes back to your pre-qualifying questions. What's your income? And if their income is only, I don't know, $5,000 a month, and they're looking at properties that are 2,500, that's 50% of their income, right? So get creative, ask them what else they, what other sources of income they have, and add that. So again, child support is often one, child tax benefit might be another. So add that so that you are helping them look really great on paper, because this is what the landlord is gonna be looking at when you submit the offer. It's gonna be their rental application with supporting documents, and then your offer. So make sure that you're helping them look as I said, really good on paper. So asking all the right questions. So talking about that, of course, once you've sent them that email with the rental application and the TREB listings, hopefully they like some properties. They want to see three to four, and you're going to take them out on Saturday. Um, setting them up on prospect search, again, this isn't TREB training, but um, going in and setting that up, creating a new prospect search in TREB, or setting them up in Collab if you know how to do that. Um, if that's your preference, that's also an option. So just creating a new search. That way they'll be receiving emails from you every day with listings that match their search criteria. And then as I said, hopefully they reply. They say they want to see a few properties. You take them out, you show them some. And then as you go through the process, really making sure, you know, what did you like about property number one? When you show them property number two, uh, you know, how does this compare to property number one? By the time you've shown them three or four, you should definitely know which one they're leaning towards. So if they do like a property, then great. Let them know, you know, you can prepare the offer. Let them know they have to send their documents to you immediately, that rental application and the documents, and really emphasize that because if they don't do it right away, the property is going to be gone. If it takes them two days to gather their documents and send it to you, um, as I said, that property is going to be already leased. 
Uh, so, you know, you might even want to incorporate that into your initial conversation, uh, but definitely telling them that if they're interested so that you can go away, start typing up the offer uh, while you're expecting to receive the email with their supporting documents. So, um, showing, just a quick note about this, just because we have had, um, you know, there are times when, you know, no fault of your own, you show up at a property and maybe your client doesn't show up or maybe they show up and they say, you know what, we don't like it from the outside. We don't even want to walk in. Uh, just a really quick reminder um, and an important reminder to cancel that showing. I know it seems silly because you may, as I said, have shown up. You might literally be outside, but if you don't go in, go ahead and cancel it. It has that. That's been a situation that's come up recently where it's resulted in a fine. So a $500 fine is definitely something you want to avoid. So make sure you're not sharing the lockbox code with clients, you're attending all showings, and if you have to cancel, cancel. Um, so that's all, all I'll say about that. Uh, if you are brand new to real estate and you haven't scheduled showings before, there are a couple of ways of doing that. You can go into your MLS listing and you can either click on the online uh, link at the top or you can call the listing brokerage. Give them your information, uh, set yourself up with that brokerage, request the date and time, and they'll send you an email with the lockbox code. If they say all usual, that just means, you know, leave your business cards. Make sure you have business cards with you when you're uh, taking clients out on showing. All right, um, again, it's not a CRM training, but just a quick reminder, once you have taken them out on a showing, coming into your CRM and updating that activity after you've taken them out on the showing. The reason for that is because the Zolo bot, as soon as you enter this update, the lead is gonna get um, an, an auto email or an auto text from the Zolo bot asking how they rate their Zolo agent. So uh, again, something you want them to receive after they've met you and not prematurely, not before they've met you. So um, updating your showings after the fact. And for leases, it's not necessary to put in the MLS number. If you put in the MLS number for properties that are available for sale, then once you click on submit update, again, the Zolo bot sends out a CMA report, but it won't do that for leases. So don't even worry about putting in MLS numbers. Just click on submit update. So the Zolo bot knows that you're a busy agent, you're active, and you're taking people out on showings. All right. So here we go. Here's the, uh, the nuts and bolts of it. So preparing an offer to lease. All right. So as I've already talked about, the rental application and the supporting documents are going to come from the tenant. The rental application has their personal information, where they work, where they live, where they previously lived. Um, and the documents that you're requesting are their credit report and proof of income, whether that's an employment letter or pay stub, and their photo ID. So that's going to be provided to you um, by the tenant. And what you're going to be preparing for the offer to lease is going to be the agreement to lease. You're going to attach Schedule A and B if there is one. The Schedule A is already auto-populated for you in web form. So all of these documents you're going to create in web forms. Um, so the agreement to lease already has an attached schedule A and there are some clauses in there that you can use. Make sure that you're reading them so that you know what it is that you're including in the schedule A. And then make sure of course that everything is covered in the schedule A. So an example that I use all the time is if you're showing a property that has a pool, the standard schedule A that we have in web forms doesn't talk about a pool because that's not you know, a common clause. Uh, but if there is a pool, make sure that you're adding a clause in there about who's gonna open the pool, who's gonna close it, who's gonna maintain it. So that's what I mean. Pay attention to the property, pay attention to what's in the schedule A and make sure that um, you know, everything is covered in there. Um, the schedule B is something that again, you'll find attached to the MLS listing. And schedule B is prepared by the listing brokerage and it talks about where the deposit is going to go, whether or not it's going to you know, gain interest. But uh, a lot of brokerages don't use a Schedule B for leases. So if there isn't one, you may want to reach out to the listing agent just to make sure. But if there isn't one attached to the MLS listing, then there is probably not required. So just attach the Schedule A. Um, all right, and then we're going to do confirmation of co-op. So that also gets attached to your offer. And then there's two forms that are not attached to the offer. This is between you and your client, which is the tenant's representation agreement and working with a realtor. So when you're sending the offer to the listing agent, I like to do it like this. I like to have a PDF, two PDFs, one that is the rental application with the supporting documents all merged as one document, and separately the offer to lease, which is the agreement to lease, the schedule A and B, and the confirmation of co-op. That's what you're gonna be sending to the listing agent. The tenant representation agreement and working with a realtor, those forms must be completed 
you know, at the time of preparing the offer or before, because this authorizes you as their agent. So you want to make sure that that gets done. And last but not least, the FinTrack form is not usually necessary, but if you have received funds over $10,000, so like I said, if they're paying the year up front, or maybe it's a really high end lease, maybe it's $5,000, um, then first and last month's rent is obviously going to be $10,000. So that's the only time you would do a FinTrack, but typically not necessary uh, for leases. And then really last but not least, we talked about this at the beginning, the residential tenancy agreement. Uh, so again, we'll talk about that um, in a bit again, but this is between the landlord and the tenant, and it reiterates all of the accepted terms of the agreement to lease. So it is now available in web forms as well, so really easy to fill in and complete. Uh, so make sure that, uh, you know, if you are going to do that, if you are going to volunteer to do that for everybody, then make sure it's done at the end so that you're not constantly revising the RTA, right? Get the agreement to lease accepted and then go ahead and prepare the RTA, the Residential Tenancy Agreement. All right, so let me see if I've got questions coming in. Uh, rent increases for the following year. So yeah, typically I don't put that into an agreement to lease. Sometimes though, there are times that the tenant might want to say, you know what, I want to lease the property for two years. And if that's going to be accepted by the landlord, then there might be a paragraph in Schedule A saying that, you know, the applicable rent increase, whatever's allowable for that year, will be applied to year two. So that's, yeah, definitely something you would put in the Schedule B, or sorry, Schedule A. But typically, if it's an agreement to lease just for a year, then I wouldn't talk about rent increases. Rent increases are actually covered in the residential tenancy agreement. That's why it is, I guess, that's why it exists. <laughs> the residential tenancy agreement is actually uh, it was prepared by Government of Ontario, and there's 14 pages, the last seven of which all go over landlord and tenant responsibilities. And uh, it talks about rent increases there as well, I believe. So um, if anything is in the residential tenancy agreement, uh, and it's also, it, there's a discrepancy between the Schedule A and the residential tenancy agreement, just know that the residential tenancy agreement always wins. So um, an example of that is if you say in the Schedule A, that uh, the, the tenant's gonna be providing post-dated checks, and if any of these checks bounce, then there's gonna be an NSF fee of $100. That used to be a thing that the landlords, you know, landlords used to, used to like to request, but now the residential tenancy agreement says that landlords aren't allowed to charge more than, I think it's $25. So uh, again, if there's a discrepancy between the Schedule A and the residential tenancy agreement, just advise your clients the residential tenancy agreement uh, wins all day long. All right. So let's talk about web forms because that's where you're going to go and you're going to find all these documents to prepare. So web forms, you can find it right on the homepage. You can also find it under MLS services, uh, which is which will give you this long list of links and it's right down at the very bottom. This is not where I'm going to recommend that you go. I'm going to recommend that you pull up the subject property on MLS. So if you are writing an offer on 241 Beachfield Road in Oakville, uh, it's available for a lease for $4,200 a month. So that's a good lease to do. Uh, I would recommend going to web forms by clicking on web forms up at the top. The reason for that is because it's going to take you to web forms and it's going to auto populate some of this information that you see on the MLS listing. It's going to auto populate that into some of your forms for you. So you won't have to copy type everything. Some of the work will be done for you. So it'll take you to your member dashboard and it'll actually take you directly to this screen right here. It's going to pop up this dialog box, create transaction. And the deals department wants you to name all of your transaction kits with the address of the property. But I always say, I don't remember my clients by their address. I remember them by their name. So give the deals department what they want, put in the name of the transaction kit to be the address of the property, and then in brackets, put your client's name. From there, the template that you're gonna select is Zolo Residential in square brackets, and then offer lease. So there's three in this category that you would choose from. Uh, offer condo if you are writing an offer to purchase uh, a condo, offer freehold if you are writing an offer to purchase a freehold, or this third one, offer lease, regardless of whether or not it's a condo or a detached. So if you are writing an offer to lease, this is the template you are selecting, which means all of those documents that I showed you before that you need to prepare uh, will be auto-populated into this transaction kit for you, so you don't have to remember and add those manually. So again, we're trying to do some of the work for you here. Um, and then it says import data. Again, if you were coming directly from that MLS listing, it would automatically enter the MLS number there and auto populate some of the information into the forms in your transaction kit. So 
You can use the wizard, that's up to you, or unselect it. Either way, click on create, and that's going to create your transaction kit. So let's see what this looks like. So this is going to be the transaction kit. These are going to be all of the forms that are already auto-populated for you. You'll see that there are a couple of things here. The rental application. So you do have an opportunity here to type out the rental application or retype it. Again, sometimes tenants don't represent themselves in the best possible way on paper. If they didn't disclose all of their income, they only disclose their employment income instead of all of those additional sources of income, then you might want to copy type it have the rental application really showcase them in the best possible way, and then just have them re-sign it. The offer summary document form 801 is actually not required for leases, but sometimes you have listing agents who request it. If they request it, give it to them, uh, but if not, it's not necessary. But we've included it as part of the transaction kit um, in case they ask for it, but again, not necessary. What you're gonna wanna complete for an offer to lease is gonna be the agreement to lease, and the confirmation of co-op. Those are going to be the two forms uh, that form your offer to lease. And then the tenant representation agreement and working with a realtor, that has to be done between you and the client. So obviously everything gets done at the same time, but I'm just noting what gets sent to the listing agent and what you keep on file for the deals department later on. So these are going to be your forms. And again, you don't need to remember to add these individually because you've selected the correct template kit and they've been auto-populated for you. So all you have to do is click on each document in order to go to that form so you can actually fill in the blank. So if you were to click on agreement to lease, the agreement to lease would pop up and you would fill in the blank. So as I said, the tenant's name would be left blank. You would enter that, you would type that in. The landlord's name should be typed for you. The address of the landlord is left blank at this point because we don't know it yet. And then there are 10 paragraphs that need to be completed. So the premises, which is the address, the term of the lease, which is typically going to be one year, the rent, so that's going to be the rent you're offering. Again, suggest to your clients that you don't offer less, you know, go full price, go a little bit over, especially if you're in competition. Uh, it's payable on the first of every month. That's typically what it's going to be. And then the deposit and prepaid rent is paragraph four. So I actually have a cheat sheet that I'm going to share with you guys here. And this is, um, these are all of the paragraphs that need to be completed on the agreement to lease. So again, a little cheat sheet, paragraph one is your property address. Paragraph two is the term of the lease, which is typically gonna be one year. For easy math here, let's say the rent is $2,000. So paragraph three, you would say $2,000. And then paragraph four, you have some options. So the deposit and the prepaid rent. All right, so the tenant delivers, and then you have three options here, either upon acceptance, here with, or as otherwise described in this agreement, by negotiable check, it should be a bank draft payable to the listing brokerage. So you're putting in there, not the listing brokerage, not listing brokerage like that, but the actual listing brokerage's name. So you would put Remax or Sutton or Zolo, whatever it is, in the amount of $4,000 because that's first and last month. And then you say against the first and last month's rent. So that's how you fill it in. Those three options, if you select that the tenant delivers upon acceptance, this bank draft, that means they have 24 hours um, upon acceptance to deliver the deposit. So, you know, they'll have to deliver it to the listing brokerage's um, office so that they can deposit it into their account. Otherwise, you may ask your tenant to go and uh, go to the bank, get a bank draft, send you a, a picture of it, and then you can attach it to your offer. That would be delivering it here with, or as otherwise described in this agreement, if your tenant is going to wire transfer it uh, or some other, some other way. Maybe they're structuring it in a couple of payments. You know, sometimes if people are paying, you know, quite a bit up front or an increased deposit, there might be a different structure. So as otherwise described in this agreement, you would select that, and then you would put it in the Schedule A as to what it is that they're doing. So, again, bank draft payable to whatever the listing brokerage is in the amount of whatever the amount is against first and last month's rent. So there are going to be times that they decide not to take the property on the first, maybe, again, to get their offer accepted, look more appealing to the landlord they might say you know what we're going to move in since, since it's available now we're going to move in seven days before the end of the month in which case you're going to want to prorate the rent so again using this really simple math if it's two thousand dollars a month in order to get the daily rate we're going to take the month multiply it by 12 months and divide that by 365 days that's going to give us an accurate daily rate we don't want to just go ahead and say two thousand dollars a month divided by 31 days that's not going to give us an accurate daily rate. So make sure you're multiplying it by 12 months and dividing it by 365 days. And then you're taking that daily rate, 
and multiplying it by the number of days that they are going to move in early. So if they're going to move in, you know, October 25th, then they have seven days before the end of the month that they're paying extra for. So it would be an additional $460.25 in addition to the $4,000 for first and last month's rent. So that's how you would state it. That's how you would put it in the agreement. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. That paragraph sometimes can be the one that, uh, you know, is, is not confusing, but the one that takes kind of just a minute to get used to. So if it's your first time writing an offer, uh, hopefully that explains it for you. The rest of the paragraphs are going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, what's the use of the property? Residential. What are the services and costs? Take a look at the MLS listing agreement or MLS information sheet. Uh, see what is included with the rent. Uh, so just check off the applicable boxes. Parking. Is there a two-car garage? Is it a two-car private driveway? Is there an underground parking stall? Whatever it is, specify the parking. Additional terms. So Schedule A and B, I always put that in there. The additional terms are set out in Schedule A and B, <laughs> which you'll repeat in the next paragraph. So it's up to you if you want to say that. But definitely the additional terms are going to be set out in the residential tenancy agreement. So that's usually what I put in paragraph eight. Additional terms are going to be set out in Schedule A and B and the residential tenancy agreement. Schedule nine does ask you if there are any schedules attached. So you just repeat yourself, Schedule A and B. And then irrevocability, 24 hours after the date and time sent, unless, of course, you can tighten that up. So if you're submitting an offer first thing in the morning, hopefully you can get an answer by the end of the day. So um, if you have questions about when you should set that to expire, reach out to your growth manager, strategize on the offer that it is that you're writing, and uh, you know maybe you give them less than 24 hours uh, to, to look at this, just so that they're not shopping your offer around and they're not getting other offers uh, you know, while they're considering yours. All right, the signature page. Let me know how we're doing so far. So this, there's a lot of signatures. <laughs> Just by looking at it, you can see there's a lot of signatures. So what you want to do is you want to have your tenant sign paragraph 21. So once you've prepared the entire agreement to lease, get them to sign paragraph 21. Don't have them sign the acknowledgement down at the bottom. This is a common mistake. And in fact, I think that signature right now is auto-populated in web forms. If you go through to AuthentiSign, you'll see that that gets auto-populated. Just make sure that you're deleting it. You don't want the tenant to be signing that they've acknowledged receipt of an accepted copy when it hasn't even been accepted yet. So the only thing you're doing is signing under paragraph 21. You need to wait for the landlord to actually accept it by signing also under paragraph 21 confirming acceptance, and then acknowledging receipt before you can acknowledge receipt of the accepted copy. So if the landlord accepts, that's what it's going to look like. Your tenant, your client signs under paragraph 21, and then the landlord doesn't make any changes in this example, and then goes ahead and accepts the offer. So they're going to sign under paragraph 21, they're going to confirm the acceptance, and then they're going to acknowledge receipt of the accepted copy. At that point, your client can sign the acknowledgement, not before. So again, lots of signatures with this one, and that's why I like to kind of point it out quickly. Um, but it doesn't always come back just accepted without any revisions. A lot of times you will have sent in your offer, so your tenant would have signed under paragraph 21, but now the landlord has made a bunch of changes. Maybe they've added to the Schedule A that they want the tenant to do the snow removal and the lawn care, which is fine, <laughs> typical. Um, so then they'll sign under paragraph 21, but now it's your client who needs to initial those changes on the Schedule A, and then they're going to confirm acceptance and acknowledge receipt of an accepted copy for the landlord to then acknowledge theirs. So again, too many signatures on this page, so I like to break it down, especially if this is your first time writing an offer. All right. Attached to your offer is going to be the Schedule A, which I mentioned at the beginning, is already auto-populated for you with some standard clauses. Make sure you're reading them. Make sure that uh, you know everything applies. For example, I think the paragraph about appliances talks about you know the appliances being in good working order. Fridge, stove, dishwasher, microwave. If there's no microwave, take the microwave out. So that sort of thing. Read through it. Make sure that everything in the Schedule A applies um, to to the property you're writing an offer on. All right. So we did this the other day. Uh, we don't have time to get into you know like a live transaction, how to how to work all this. So if you need a little bit more guidance, again, I will post the GM channel so you guys can take a look at web forms and how to send documents to AuthentiSign. This is a screenshot of it. But really, um, if you see in the background here, over here on the right-hand side, you're basically in the form section. So these are all the forms after you've already filled out all the information. You can go and you can select the forms that you want signed. 
And behind this box, I should have another screenshot of this, um, but there's a basket. So you basically select the basket and you send all of those documents that you selected, you're sending it now to Authentisign by clicking on this Authentisign, this pen icon. That's gonna send it to Authentisign. You can send it to your client for signature. And then once you get it back, you can send it to the listing agent um, as part of your offer, right? So you're gonna obviously need to send signed versions of these forms uh, to the listing agent when you're submitting the offer. So let's talk about that. Presenting the offer to the listing agent, we will close on this because this is just another template of what you need to be sending to, um, or, or what you should send to the listing agent. So uh, definitely make sure in the subject line, you're saying that it's an offer to lease. You don't wanna just type in the address. The listing agent might see that and think it's just a question about the property. So really highlight the fact that it's an offer to lease. Put that right in the subject line with the address. Um, and then in the body of the email, let them know you're attaching the rental application with supporting documents. So again, that's one PDF. And then the offer to lease as a separate PDF. This is where we get to do some creative writing. Really, you know, take a paragraph, just a few sentences to talk about your clients, how wonderful they are, what their situation is, why they love the house, you know, embellish as much as you can. Uh, a quick tip here that I'll mention again, uh, which has worked for me, I've heard, it's worked for other agents here at Zolo. If you have a family photo, attach that as well. I mean, obviously we're doing our best to make them look really great on paper, that rental application that we talked about at the beginning, but a picture is worth a thousand words. So attach a photo, it just introduces them virtually to the landlord, um, you know, a lot better than just, you know, credit scores. So attach a photo, you know, maybe, you know, something will resonate in their bio, maybe they'll, you know, be reminded of themselves. Uh, there's so many examples of why that's a good idea, but definitely um, attaching a family photo if you have one. And then highlighting what it is that they're offering. So when are they looking to take possession? What's the term? What's the rate? What's the deposit? So hopefully that rate is full price. Hopefully the deposit is, you know, maybe even a little bit more than first and last month's rent. You may want your tenant to, um, you know, volunteer to pay first and last two months rent. Again, that's going to position your offer better, um, especially when you're in a multiple offer situation. So letting the agent know when it's irrevocable. And then, as I said, I will prepare the residential tenancy agreement upon receipt of the accepted offer. So that's something I put in the offer email. And I think it just stands out as, you know, you're going to be really easy to work with. Um, so again, it might just be another consideration when they are thinking about which offer to accept. So thank you in advance for your consideration. I look forward to hearing from you. So however you want to say it short and sweet, this is just an example of what you might want to send to the listing agent. So we talked about winning, um, how to win these, these offers in multiple situations. So of course, these are not going to be objections because you dealt with it at the very beginning. You dealt with it during that initial phone call. They don't just have a single income that's not enough. You've asked them for multiple sources of income. Uh, you're definitely disclosing on the rental application that their uh, income is it can definitely afford the rent. The rent is not going to be 30% or more. It's going to be you know 30% or lower than their income. Uh, low credit score, no, same thing. You, you've addressed this right during your uh, initial phone call with this particular client. Hopefully they have a credit score in the 700. So that's not going to be an objection by the listing agent. And then not enough stability is, again, a question about whether or not, you know, if you're working with somebody who's brand new to Canada, make sure that that situation is presented. You call the listing agent before you even show the property because you don't want this to be an objection. There are some landlords that don't have any issues, um, you know, with people who are brand new to Canada, while others, you know, may want to see somebody, you know, who's had, uh, you know, a job for a really long time. Uh, you know, they're not worried about whether or not they're going to like it, whether or not they're going to be able to stand the cold. <laughs> are they going to want to go back in three months? So every landlord is different. Take the time to make that phone call. It's less time than showing them a property that they won't, that they don't stand a chance at getting. So that will not be an objection. All right. Winning the deal. As I said, present the offer with a family photo. Make sure that the agent receives the offer. So call the, the uh, listing brokerage to register your offer or just ask the listing agent to confirm receipt of your offer. If you don't hear back, then yeah, follow up. Uh, because again, you don't want to be following up the next day to find out what their decision is. And then, oh, they never got it. They went with somebody else. So um, other ideas, offering more rent, which we've already talked about, offering more of a deposit and offering an earlier start date uh, if the property is available immediately, especially in multiple offer situations, that is going to position your offer, um, you know, better, hopefully, than the other offers. So incorporating all of these will ensure that you're winning the deal. And as somebody mentioned before, sometimes you do have 
a really qualified tenant, sometimes, you know, you're offering more rent, you're offering more deposit. It's happened to me. I know it's happened to others that it still doesn't get accepted. It just means that wasn't the right place for them. But at least, you know, you're working with qualified tenants and you can just move on to the next and hopefully get that one um, accepted. All right. So there were lots of questions about the residential tenancy agreement. So this is now available on web forms, which is great. So you want to make sure that you are filling in all of the information. As I said, there's 14 pages. The first seven just reiterates the accepted terms of the um, agreement to lease. So why do we do this? Because there's seven additional pages that talk about the landlord and tenant rights and responsibilities. So if there's any ever a question that comes up, this is going to be really important for them to review. Um, you know, just in, in anticipation of any sort of dispute, hopefully they can resolve it by just looking at the residential tenancy agreement. So making sure that this is prepared, it needs to be prepared at some point after your offer has been accepted and before they move in. Um, and then again, this exchanges information, their contact information. So now the landlord will be able to reach your client directly and vice versa. So if they have, um, you know, anything that needs repaired or whatever, they're not going to be calling you. They've got the, uh, the landlord's information. So make sure that that gets done, again, before they move in. All right. Last but not least, closing the transaction. That may feel like that's the end of it. But as I said, with leases, we sort of wear all of the different hats. <laughs> so we kind of have to see this right through to close. So making sure that they deliver the deposit check, um, you know, reminding them to transfer utilities, to get tenant insurance, post-dated checks. Uh, post-dated checks is something that is often requested by landlords, and honestly, not a lot of people even have checks anymore. So really make sure you're giving them enough time to order these checks from the bank, write them all out. Sometimes they have to write out 12, sometimes they have to write out 24 checks. So make sure you give them enough of a heads up to do that. Um, and the utilities and the tenant insurance, you're going to need proof of that so you can send it to the listing agent. Um, and then meeting with the landlord and the client on or before occupancy to do a walkthrough, note any deficiencies, and exchange those keys and post-dated checks. So definitely that's what has to be done on your end that's client-facing. But in terms of, uh, you know, the deals department, you need to update your CRM and you need to upload all of your documents to web forms. So once that is all done, uh, again, this is a screenshot of your transaction kit in web forms. Definitely making sure that you are changing the status so it always defaults to open when you prepare an offer. So just go ahead and change that to firm or failed if that's the situation. Uh, but firm deal will notify the deals department that they have to look at your documents. And you need to upload all of your documents to your checklist. So you prepared them in the form section. And then you save them somewhere on your computer when you were negotiating back and forth with the listing agent. And now that everything's been fully accepted, fully executed, you, you want to come back into web forms and upload those final documents into your checklist, which will bring you to this list right here. So if you click on checklist, again, it shows you all of the documents that need to be uploaded. And you can simply click on attach, find them wherever it is that you save them on your computer, attach them to your transaction kit, and the deals department will know to take a look because you've changed that status to firm. All right, I think that covers it. The CRM I mentioned, but this is a screenshot of it, uh, definitely filling in the information that's required there. Uh, so entering in all of your activity from that initial call to the showing, the deal, that's gonna keep your CRM really active. It's gonna uh, continue to generate leads for you. The Zolobot will see that you're active and it rewards active agents with leads. So making sure that you're updating all of those activities. So I think that's it. Uh, this is just, again, the CRM, just showing uh, the forms that you, or sorry, the blanks that you need to fill in. Um, but again, last but not least, the fortune is really in the follow-up. So, you know, if you do have a lease lead that, um, you know, you think will likely be buying, you know, eventually, you know, in a year, in two years, real estate is a long game. Uh, definitely follow up with them the month after they move in, make sure everything is going well, and then follow up with them in a year, two years, you know, have some sort of a system set up for yourself that you are following up with people, uh, you know, even on birthdays, uh, just so that you're staying top of mind. So when the time comes, they do use you as their preferred agent. Awesome. Let me know if you guys have um, questions. So yeah, in terms of the Zolo commission split, what date is the matter? Uh, the closing date or the offer date? Um, so commission splits. Yeah. So it's actually the date of the offer. So if you have um, a Zolo deal and a personal deal, the, you want them both accepted in the same month for your commission split to, to apply 100% on any personal deal. So uh, that's how that works with that one. 
Uh, let me know if you guys have any other questions. So Ronnie is available to you. He's our GM who deals exclusively with, exclusively with leases. Um, but, uh, you know, definitely reach out to your colleagues on the leases channel under workplace and feel free to reach out to me as well. I'm happy to answer any questions. And yeah, as I said, I will post the GM YouTube channel, which is where this one will be posted. So it takes about an hour for it to process and then I'll upload it to YouTube share that with you guys but there are previous ones that you can check out as well so I know somebody mentioned earlier that they have a lease that they're working on today so hopefully uh, this helps hopefully you feel super confident now going out there and preparing your offer to lease I hope you win it I hope you all win it um, and uh, yeah let me know have that system in place let me know how it works let me know what you've implemented that works even better I'd love to incorporate that and in the meantime if there are questions I'm here for you guys um, so yeah, let me know. Keep me posted and I will see you guys on the next webinar. Thanks so much for joining me today. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.